from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good evening. From Coolidge Auditorium in the Library of Congress, Washington, D.C., WETA presents Three American Poets on Creating and Translating Poetry. This evening, poets Ben Bellet and John Frederick Nims will read and discuss their own poetry and selections from their translations of great poems. Talking with Mr. Bellet and Mr. Nims will be James Dickey, consultant in poetry to the Library of Congress. Mr. Dickey, recipient of the National Book Award for his volume of 22 poems, Buck Dancer's Choice, was born in Atlanta in 1923. Before turning his attention exclusively to poetry, Mr. Dickey was a star college athlete, a night fighter pilot in World War II and Korea, and a successful advertising executive in New York and Atlanta. His first book of poetry, Into the Stone, was published in 1960 and has been followed by four more volumes. He is now enjoying his second term as the library's poetry consultant. And now here is Mr. James Dickey. Uh, thank you, Dr. Baslow. Well, uh, welcome. Uh, and this, uh, the first poetry reading of my last year as poetry consultant, we have with us Ben Bellet uh, on my left uh, and John Frederick Nims on my right. Uh, Mr. Nims was born in Muskegon, Michigan, and is now on sabbatical leave for a year from the University of Illinois at Chicago Circle. Uh, he has been long and rewardingly with us in a good many roles, a poet, author of The Iron Pastoral, A Fountain in Kentucky and Other Poems, Knowledge of the Evening, Poems 1950-1960, and most recently, uh, Of Flesh and Bone. In addition, he has been the proud and good translator of San Juan de la Cruz and other Spanish poets. He believes in the precarious alliance of wit and unabashed lyricism, in passion and precision, in high verbal spirits and energetic reflection. Ben Bellet was born in New York City, was educated at the University of Virginia, and now teaches literature at Bennington College in Vermont. He is the author of The Five-Fold Mesh, Wilderness Stair, and most recently, The Enemy Joy, New and Selected Poems. He, too, is translated from the Spanish and also from the French. His rendering of Rambo's Libato Eva is an acknowledged classic of its kind, and this has been followed by large-scale translations in depth of Pablo Neruda and Rafael Alberti. Both Mr. Nims and Mr. Bellet are lively and indispensable critics and commentators on the poetic scene, and they both have the extra dimensions of other languages, other poetic disciplines than the English and the American. Mr. Nims and Mr. Bellet will each read from his own work, and also, if we are all very good and very lucky, from translations he has done. This should lead us into a discussion not only of the original work of these poets, but into an exchange on the subject of translation. This particular field looms larger and larger as the earth shrinks, and it is of very great interest and importance to hear the opinions and the renderings of two of the most highly regarded, resourceful, intelligent, and devoted poets engaged in the difficult task of carrying their poetic brothers on their backs from one language to another. Uh, we shall begin with Mr. Bellet <coughs> reading his own poems with whatever comment either Mr. Nims or I see fit to make. And then we shall have Mr. Nims read from his work with similar commentary. Then Mr. Bellet will read from his translations followed by Mr. Nims. 
the hope being that this procedure will open the way for discussion of the whole subject of translation in its varied, frustrating, necessary, and, again, with luck, creative forms. Mr. Bellet. Well, the whole subject of translation is, of course, um, uh, boundless, uh, but perhaps we can make some modest uh, penetration into that uh, very embattled area. And uh, since Mr. Dickey has been good enough to deliver both Mr. Nims and uh, myself from the uh, limbo or the ignominy of uh, the hyphenated uh, poet translator, <clears throat> who is a little bit of both, but not uh, much of either. Uh, perhaps um, I can go on to say that, uh, in another sense, it has always been my feeling that all poets uh, translate, that poets are uh, constitutional, uh, inveterate uh, translators. Uh, it would be my view that in the beginning perhaps was not the word, but the uh, translation uh, by which I think I would mean some uh, pre-verbal urge to transfer relations. Uh, the relationship, let's say, between one object and another object, which would presumably give us a metaphor, or the relationship between objects and the uh, feelings and ideas to which they give rise, which might lead us into uh, metaphysics, uh, between some inner world where, as uh, Pablo Neruda, once said in a very strange poem to his legs, uh, all comes to an end and concludes in my feet. And uh, some outer world where, as he went on to uh, explain, the hostile and alien begins, all the names of the world, outposts and frontiers, the noun and its adjective that my heart never summoned, uh, even one supposes if his heart was in his mouth. Well, in this sense, I hope it's not stretching a point too much, and uh, yet I would like to make it. All is translation, isn't it? And uh, all poets uh, constantly translate, and it is very natural, it seems to me, to come upon uh, the further dimension of uh, the translation of uh, poems. Well, I try to say something like this in two uh, different poems concerned with the uh, cerebral and uh, visceral origins of this uh, naming of the world, as Neruda calls it, uh, or the translation of it by poets, as I would uh, call it. Now, one poem takes its... Uh, text very appropriately from Genesis, where all things should begin. Uh, Whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And uh, the poem chooses the first Sabbath of creation, when the birds of the air and the beasts of the field uh, having been created by a somewhat absent-minded God, uh, waited to be named by Adam. Now, certainly, it seems to me, this was a moment of maximum uh, peril and pathos for human uh, reality. It uh, would seem that in that lull uh, between the creation of the animal kingdom and the translation of it into names, to words, by uh, Adam, uh, the whole world of objects 
lay in a state of uh, inchoate incompletion outside of the individual perceiver awaiting the human act of recognition uh, to make it real. And uh, by identifying the uh, particular which was at once true for him and true for the object as he saw it, I would say that Adam is our first translator, our first poet, and heaven help us, perhaps our first hyphenated poet translator. <laughs> so allow me first to read that poem. I call it Second Adam, so there'll be no confusion between this and uh, uh, the uh, and Holy Writ. Uh, there are modifications. When the deluge had passed into my head by twos came the creeping things, the horn of their jawbones shining, and the things of the air, wing cases breaking like clasp knives, asking their names. Stormlight colored their passing with an animal imminence. They wheeled on the pile of their plumage in the dread of their animal being and rode in the arc of my head where the possible worked like a sea. Nothing was given me there. Nothing was known. Feather and scale, concussions of muscle and fur, the whale and the name for the whale, rose on the void like a water spout, being and ceasing to be, till keel clashed and I spoke. Mayfly, wood weasel, stingray, cormorant, mole. Choosing the syllables, holding a leaf to the torrent, unharmed and infallible, while creation descended in twos. Uh, the second poem is ostensibly about the behavior of uh, hornets as observed at very close range on a patio in Mexico. I remember that uh, what attracted me at the time was the fanatical devotion of the hornets to some species of work, and let's call it translation, uh, for which I could see no visible outcome as I watched. The endless uh, circling and circling of hornets about a very nondescript hive without the addition of a single cell or the storage of a single egg. Now, since the uh, law of their species, uh, I believe that hornets, like wasps, are honeyless, uh, didn't allow them or me to postulate, in the absence of a better answer, some Schopenhauerian will to honey, um, I concluded that they must be heroes of pure idea, uh, tirelessly at work, on the formalization of the invisible. In short, poets or uh, translators. <laughs> so the poem is called The Hornet's House. Upside down on their millstone, the hornets had already begun that labor for slaves oblique under balancing weights where their universe hung by a wick till the will of their species was done. No longer honing their spurs under thorny abdomens and fording the midsummer, they canted their wings on a slum of old parchment, a wafer of smashed candelabrum, unweaving and weaving their omens, lent to invisible headbands, hods of invisible 
chalk and saliva, some instinct alert to their need had narrowed their compass to this, assemble them out of the gases like seed on a sunflower pod. I thought of those others, the bee in his ziggurat, ascending in savory waxes, the wasp turning his pouch like a fig, forcing the rind of his world like the white in the shell of an egg in a pendant's papyrus, but these, knowing nothing of resins, the Chaldean increases of stars in the hexagon, the bells of beneficent amber, what bounty could kindle their flint in the spores and the cinder of the underground places. Yet the horn and the needle palpated, made trial of their hungers till a harvest was drawn through their bellies and rolled like the thread in an hourglass a stinger of waxes and jellies and struck in consummate denial till everything blazed like a thought, like a sexual breathing of gauzes, while a kingdom of predators circling put forth its antennas and the poem arose like a hornet in rabbinical blacks and siennas on craters and crosses. This uh, is a somewhat further cry, but uh, I would say that the uh, translation of the first person singular uh, is another labor constantly forced on the poet, uh, even when, like myself, he hasn't much heart for the uh, song of myself. Uh, I would confess freely that that is a last rather than a first resort. I generally am more interested in the, the otherness of the world, the heterogeneity of the world, uh, than the degree to which it submits to my particular passion for turning all other things uh, into myself. Now, the poem I want to read is called The Orphaning, and uh, it is only partly autobiographical. Um, I would say, actually, it seeks to translate states of deprival, of aloneness, um, or gross failures, uh, renewals of kinship of some sort, uh, all of those depredations of the ego uh, by which life is diminished and um, action is uh, so often subverted by cunning. Um, the um, idiot, I ought to explain, to whom allusion is made in the opening section of the poem is Dostoevsky's uh, the parents in the closing section would be my own, and in between lies the search for some viable action that would carry one directly, spontaneously uh, into life without guile or without uh, self-interest. Uh, the offening, clear idiot, I understand. The adversary need not be struck or the blow returned. Your foreknowledge of the deed is enough and proves mighty. You named it innocency, the receptive faculty, the negative power, and wore it under the recoil of the loved hand and the hated hand, falling equally, falling always. You said, yes, I know. The blow comes as I knew it would come. I foresaw it all. I am not angry. You turned into your secrecy, smiled for a world's perfidy, and denied yourself the act. All this was false. The act alone is innocent and sweetens. 
The child strikes with his fist in the womb's haven, and the father replies with a lover's spasm, spend, reply, what was kept has betrayed you. See, the rage fails, the restorative rage, and the hate talks with its cause over the infamous pit, touching nothing. Your awkwardness with tools, all the gear of action, your poor record at the shooting range are the fruit of a denial. Raise the gun to your shoulder. It is heavier than you knew. Slam the bolt, too. It will not lock to your blow. Only what is given is. Only the act returns. Be returned. It is time you named your enemy. Your instruments have devoured you. The poem, the kiss, the loss, the image, the afterthought. The orphan in the disinfected corridor crying integrity like Job on the ash mound. Your compass moved upon self always as on a dial when you thought to pass beyond it magnetic to your incompletion. Choice was a compass's fiction, and control only the needle's need to point to the self when possibility opened beyond and trembled to a standstill there. Always volition lay outside, deep in the play of the act itself, free, bold, availing, neither enemy nor friend, partial or entire, chosen or compelled. Mother, in that darkness into which you go, which is not Lear's or Homer's, not Karen's bowsprit bearing the devious Florentine on the downward eddy to allegorical heaven, nothing dreamt or dissembled or given the spirit to know to prove it precarious like thirst or the gift of tears, but blindness itself, a smashing of lenses and lives. Why does my childhood tremble and my gaze go up with a child's assurance for the large loved hand of that providing walker who measures her stride to my own and steadies the balances? For I guess at a thing not desolations, and walk as toward birthdays with all my surprise made ready. You come with a gift of light, mulish and brave in the shine of sabbatical candles, wearing my blindness, not in the barbiturate sleep of the maimed, but held in the salt of a photograph, parting conventional hedges, a rich braid caught on the serious smile and the Ukrainian stance by an apron of porches, and all is returned in a dazzle. Seen, half seen, like the eyelashes arc on the eye when the sleeper wakens. Poppy seed burns on my lips. We mount up the kiosk together, my trust in your hand like a forfeit climbing the steps of my nausea, while the bell tower tips toward the dial of the orphanage clock and the iron opens outward. There all my sullen deprival surrenders its lonely disguises. There is my father, clear in the long halation. There the ascending staves of the bed, harp-like in peeling enamel, where I listen to prodigies, there grave plot, headstone, prayer shawl, where the son of the blessing arises, the sevenfold tapes on his forearm and remembers the prayer for the dead. A stone in the grave of his mouth moves and he cries from the grave clout, Father, and forgives him his dying who knew not what he did. Um, I think uh, rather, rather than discuss or talk about uh, your poems, Ben, in the interest of time and in getting on to what we want to talk about later on, 
We'll just let John Nims go ahead and read, uh, read from his own work now, uh, as he will. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that uh, most of us prefer what we've done lately. We're so happy there is anything we've done lately, perhaps. Uh, but I know that I find it rather embarrassing to read most of my uh, early work. Possibly I can read this. Oh, I know I can read this. A poem called Love Poem, which is about a person who has faults, but the faults are rather endearing. My clumsiest dear, whose hand shipwreck vases, at whose quick touch all glasses chip and ring, whose palms are bulls in china, burrs in linen, and have no cunning with any soft thing, except all ill at ease fidgeting people, the refugee uncertain at the door you make at home, deftly you steady the drunk clambering on his undulant floor. Unpredictable, dear, the taxi driver's terror, shrinking from far headlights pale as a dime, yet leaping before red apoplectic streetcars, misfit in any space and never on time, a wrench in clocks in the solar system, only with words and people and love you move at ease, in traffic of wit expertly maneuver, and keep us all devotion at your knees, forgetting your coffee spreading on our flannel, your lipstick grinning on our coat, so gaily in love's unbreakable heaven, our souls on glory of spilt bourbon float. <laughs> Be with me, darling, early and late. Smash glasses. I will study wry music for your sake. For should your hands drop white and empty, all the toys of the world would break. Sometimes we can talk about how poems originate. I don't know whether we ought to or not. I rather like something that Howard Nemiroff says. I wrote this poem while I was writing this poem. <laughs> um, here is one, however, that began with only a cadence. Poems begin in all kinds of ways. Generally, I think not with ideas, but with, the way, with an image, with the way two words go together, or maybe just a cadence. I was reading uh, a chorus of Euripides and came across a rhythm called Ionic Aminore, which is two short syllables followed by two longs. And uh, my mind started moving that way. And I wondered what kind of poem that might turn into. Uh, I found out only later that both Valerie and Eliot have admitted that some of their poems started with pure cadence but they had no idea what they were going to say. And that's rather the way this poem, which is really a love poem, started, with an attempt to see what might be done in English with this foot of uh, two unstressed syllables followed by two stressed syllables. If you could come on the late train for the same walk or a hush talk by the fireplace, when the ash flares as a heart could, if a heart would, to recall you, to recall all in a long look, to enwrap you as it once had when the rain streamed on the fall air. And we knew then that it was all wrong. It was love lost, and a year lost of the few years we account most. But the bow blew and the cloud blew and the sky fell from its rose ledge and the woods rim to the wan brook. And the clock read to the half dead a profound page as the cloud broke and the moon spoke and the door shook. If you could come and it meant come at the steep price we regret yet as the debt swells in the nighttime. And the could come if you could hum in the skull's drum and the limbs writhe till the bed cries like a hurt thing. If you could, ah, but the moon's dead and the clock's dead. For we know now we can give all, but it won't do. Not the day's length, nor the black strength, nor the blood's flush. 
What we took once for a sure thing, for delights right, for the clear eve with its wild star in the sunset, we would have back at the old cost, at the old grief, and we beg love for the same pain for a last chance. Then the God turns with a low laugh as the leaves hush, but the eyes ice, and there's no twice. The benign gaze upon some woe, but on ours no, and the leaves rush. Uh, another from this book that I don't think started as a metrical experiment happens to be in 14ers. 14ers were really in in about the 16th century. They haven't been much in since, though Yeats has used some of them. This is called Last Judgment. and In a way, it's about the traditional idea of hell as, say, fire, uh, the suggestion that uh, this might be better than what could happen to us, could be better perhaps than knowing uh, what we have really done and can never undo, and that facing what we are is possibly the worst hell it could be, from which it would be escaped to jump into a nice cozy nest of flames. When, when we are ranged on the great plain of flabbergasting death, feeding, for our lungs hang slack, on air not drawn with breath, and see for many miles around our Easter island lie the gaping dumb show of our shame in footlights from the sky. How many a scene long out of mind in rooms we barely knew, punch amuck or Judy lewd, lit fuchsia red or blue, and see our working face in each and sway a moment numb. Then save us from our rage yourself. Let lightning cry our doom. Having such motive for their hate, each knowing what it knows, we know our terrible hearts too well to trust our luck with those. Um. This book from... Uh, which I've just been reading, had quite a lot of apparatus. It had a lot of uh, epigrams in Latin, Greek, Polish, Dutch, Catalan, uh, all kinds of things, and uh, a lot of literary poems and uh, poems referring to other works of art. And this seems to me, uh, seems to me now, not the best way to write poetry, so I tried to do a simple book called Of Flesh and Bone, and this means they're mostly about love and death. Love and death. Pray tell me, sir, what else is there? I think Emily Dickinson said. And Yeats said something very like that. And I tried to use a very simple form, like the elegiac couplet that the uh, Greek poets were very happy with for about 1,600 years. And most of them, they do use rhyme. Why? Uh, ask any folk singer. I guess. You, you don't have folk songs in free verse, as far as I know. I won't attempt a defensive rhyme, but... And also, I tried to have, have very few allusions. A few slipped by. Anacreon got in, and Goethe got in. And uh, I tried to do these in so simple a language that there weren't many adjectives. At least there weren't many uh, literary descriptive adjectives. The adjective said, Valéry is the enemy of the noun. Uh, <laughs> But most of all, I think I tried to make these sound uh, rather like speech. Uh, much good poetry, it seems to me, has been that. My reading these poems constitutes no endorsement of them, of course. I'm merely telling you what I was trying to do, and not <laughs> saying this has been done. I set a limit of eight lines for these poems arbitrarily. One is called Bikini and is a love-death poem. <laughs> the naked flesh brings tears, the way so few for love to enter, and it's quick ado. Death, the cold ogler, shrugs. By many a way comes when the whim is on him, comes to stay. 
Or, here is the same girl by the ocean, but this is in terms of her psyche, I think. If we could see it, what's going on in her mind, her memories and all, could be represented by the constellations and all the myths that uh, they've been made to stand for. It's called The Girl. Toe testing ocean on the starlit sands. Her body like brilliant reasoning she stands. And blown with the blowing dark about her face streamers like fields of force from outer space. Streamers. Her love, grief, memory seem that tree the northern lights shake glittering. Could we see We'd see all heaven cartooned, all myth aglow. See nebula shiver as she dips a toe. Or days of our years. Some of these are two lines, as this is, as you will know if you can count from the rhyme. <laughs> uh, uh, days of our years. It's brief and bright, dear children, bright and brief. Delights the lightning, the long thunder's grief. Or a poem called Love and Death. In a way, uh, this bothers me because it may seem uh, flippant, as I think many of these may seem to be. Uh, I don't think many of them are. That doesn't mean they really aren't, but I didn't mean them to be. And although this is a poem in terms of a kiss, I take it to be about love and death. And to mean something like, like this, love would be meaningless without the fact of death, or as, as uh, Wallace Stevens said, death is the mother of beauty, or it's related to Yeats, we don't begin to live until we conceive life as tragedy. I mean, nothing seems to have as much value until we see it as imperiled, and then everything is far more valuable. I'm going to some trouble to convince you this is not a flippant poem. Uh, love and death. And yet a kiss like blubber, blur and slip, without the assuring skull beneath the lip. Some literary illusions got by. A poem called With Fingering Hand refers to one of Goethe's Roman elegies. You remember Goethe in bed with his mistress and counting out the hexameter on her back <laughs> with fingering hand. <laughs> kind of shocking to think a poet has to use his fingers to count out rhythms anyway, but... <laughs> Ten, this has two speakers, some of the stereo poems. Uh, some of them are rather... Uh, <laughs> That makes them a little hard for me to read. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure how to show when one voice comes in, when another does. Ten thousand cigarettes from now, as many drinks away, I may forget. Oh, honey, hush, let sleeping lovers lay. Let sleeping lovers lie, my dear. <laughs> I know as well as you, but here's a love that's out for rhyme. Can't even that be true? <laughs> Parting. We met in error, if too close regrets, and I'm away. Yesterday was easy come, easy go today. Forget the way we burned, we two, that pain on either part. Forget we fell, convulsed as one, said knife blade to the heart. Joy is supposed to be dead, and joy is out these days, they tell me, and it's not possible for an intelligent man. Uh, a lot of poets would not agree with that. Yeats wouldn't, Retke wouldn't. Uh, quite a few of these, I think, are just plain about joy, which uh, in my experience exists. One called Vision, for example. That blonde waves lapping over rod and cone. What glee in this amorous gadget, flesh and bone. <laughs> or some make maybe a, a serious point rather lightly. Uh, this I take to be a protest against the 
the limitations of progress. It's called DOM AD 2167. When I've outlived three plastic hearts or four, another's kidneys, corneas, beep, with more unmentionable rubber, nylon, such, and when, beep, in a steel drawer, do not touch, mere brain cells in a saline wash, I thrive with thousands, taped to quaver out, alive, God grant that steel to we, beep, eyes of glass, to glitter wicked when the nurses pass. As we mentioned before, uh, both Mr. Nims and Mr. Ballard are distinguished uh, translators, uh, each with a very distinct uh, and particular vision uh, of how the rendering uh, from one language into another should be done. Uh, we have time, I think, for Mr. Bellet to read one of his translations, uh, followed by whatever discussion Mr. Nems and I uh, see fit to produce uh, in the wake of it, uh, and then for Mr. Nems to do one uh, with Mr. Bellet uh, and I uh, following. Uh, go ahead, then, and... and, uh, and uh, let us hear something from your Neruda. Well, since the whole subject is of translation is highly enigmatic to me, and all translations seem to me essays in the impossible, I've chosen a poem of Neruda's actually called Los Enigmas, the Enigmas. And uh, I think uh, his intent is to remove from you uh, progressively all possibility of solution, which is often the way the translator feels in the presence of the poem or the way the poet feels in the uh, presence of experience. Uh, here is uh, the best I could do at um, a poem which I'm sure keeps its secret and um, has more enigmas than I can tackle. You would know what the crab in its claw holes of gold weaves, and I answer, ocean will say it. You ask, what the luminous bell of the tunicate awaits in the water, what does it hope for? I tell you, it waits for the fullness of time like yourself. For whom does the alga macrocystis extend its embraces, unriddle it, riddle it out, at a time in a sea that I know, and the narwhal's malevolent ivory? Though you turn for my answer, I tell you, you stay for a stranger reply. How he suffered the killing harpoon. Or you look, it may be, for the kingfisher's plumage, a pulsation of purest beginning in the tropical water. You would sift the electrical matter that moves on the tines of the void, the stalactite splintering armor that lengthens its crystal, the barb of the angler fish, the singing extension that weaves in the depths and is loosed on the waters, I would answer you, ocean will say it. The arc of its lifetime is vast as the sea sand, flawless and numberless. Between cluster and cluster, the blood and the vintage, time brightens the flint in the petal, the beam in the jellyfish. The branches are threshed in the skein of the coral from the infinite pearl of the horn. I am that net waiting emptily, out of range of the onlooker, slain in the shadows, fingers inured to a triangle, a timid half circle's dimensions computed in oranges. Probing a starry infinitude, I came like yourselves through the mesh of my being in the night and awoke to my nakedness, all that was left of the catch, a fish in the noose of the wind. You want to comment, John? Not on that particularly, but on the problem of translation generally. A, tra a, a definition of translation that I rather like is uh, uh, Paul Valéry's. I like almost everything he wrote about poetry. But uh, 
This is what he said about translation. This is really to translate, which is to reconstitute as nearly as possible the effect of a certain cause, here a text in Spanish, by means of another cause, a text in French. He's speaking about a trans... well, obviously from Spanish into French, and what one does is reconstitute. I think this, this is really what translation is. Yes, that's good. And then, then that would then, however, be the, be the matter of the means by which this was done. Right. Uh, and, the, and the particular informing spirit of the poet which, uh, which told when this was being done and when it was not, correspondingly, when it was not being done. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, apparently, again, I'm, I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not a a at all in the league with either of you in, in matter either of, of actual translation or, or theory of translation. But it seems to me that uh, there has been a kind, of, a kind of a very real revolution in translation ever since, oh, ever since at least Mr. Eliot's essay, Euripides and Professor Murray. Uh, and uh, when, when people uh, began to, to conceive that there could be uh, a creative principle of translation which, which did not uh, in the end and in the final analysis depend on... on uh, uh, what would you say, uh, accuracy, literal, literalness. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, this, I think, I think this particular notion sparked brilliantly by Ezra Pound, uh, both in his theory and his, in his translations, particularly from the, from the Chinese, uh, which are kind of classic uh, translations of that sort, um, uh, have, have, have um, uh, begun uh, a, a particular attitude toward translation which, uh, which is carried on into our day and which has made a, ki a kind of a, um, uh, a, a, an embattled area of the whole, of the whole uh, uh, well, the whole possibility of translation. Uh, there are people who say uh, literal, literalness is all uh, and other people who say literalness is nothing. Uh, who say the, the pe people the more embattled of the anti-literalists say, uh, uh, say, say of the literal translations, translations say if you were translating uh, from Sophocles, they would say, and I have heard them say, that this is nothing more than Sophocles laid out in English. Uh, uh, on, the, on the other hand, uh, there, are those who, there are those who believe uh, that accuracy to the text uh, or formal and linguistic accuracy is the only raison d'etre for translation at all. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, one is simply substituting one's own, one own, one's own poetry for, say, the poetry of Sophocles or Rilke or Locke or whoever, whoever else it might be. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think about this, Ben? Do you have any... Surely you must well, have of course, very... that's a problem one always uh, broods about and feels uh, uh, a little guilty about uh, because... Uh, I think one very soon discovers that uh, what one is involved in is not the translation of one word into another, but the translation of poetry into poetry. And unfortunately, that doesn't follow gratuitously when one word has been put alongside, uh, one translated word has been put alongside another uh, translated uh, word. So I think so long as the uh, translator is concerned with the uh, translation of poetry, he uh, must take upon himself all aspects of the poetic process itself. Uh, it involves not merely a checklist of words which correspond or seem to correspond to the words in the original, but due process of composition, uh, reflection, choice, uh, and uh, a host and even extension uh, that uh, he finds that he must uh, cope with. Uh, I want to say one other thing, because particularly I'm talking about the translation of poetry, and um, uh, Antonio Machado, the uh, great Spanish uh, contemporary, liked to say that poetry is the word in its time. And I think the translation of poetry hasn't even begun until the translator has put a pulse underneath his language, which from that point on makes continuous demands upon him 
until the last word has been set into its rightful place in the English momentum of the thing. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, it is not uh, open-ended, that you impose controls uh, out of uh, prosody and out of the nature of the English language to which uh, a uh, poet must be sensitive and responsive. Mm -hmm. Well, I remember he spoke of Valerie's definition of translation. I remember uh, a much simpler one of Robert Frost, uh, his definition of poetry as that which is lost in translation. <laughs> uh, <laughs> now, now uh, uh, people, people of the persuasion, say, of, of the Ezra Pound, of the Chinese translations, uh, believed uh, that... Uh, that uh, the, the exact equivalences are no good in rendering uh, a poem from one language into another if when brought into the new language or to, into the, the language which is not the original language, uh, the poem is, uh, uh, as he would say in his colorful language, dead, uh, ossified. Uh, that that a, a true translation is something which creates uh, an equivalent in the second language, which is just as living a poem in that language as the as the poem was in the language from which it has been translated. Well, yes, if the second uh, language is alive to you, and it is to a poet, and he is concerned with, uh, uh, after all, translating is, is translation of poetry has to do with the transmission of power, and let's hope the transmission of of beauty, and that also has to pass into the artifact that you build out of. Uh, out of the words. And uh, I don't know if Coleridge was uh, far out enough to say that poetry is concerned with uh, the purpose of the immediate aim of poetry. The immediate aim of poetry is pleasure, not truth. I'm willing to go and then say that that has something uh, to say for translation. The immediate aim of translation should also uh, parallel poetry by, uh, by this immediacy, immediacy of uh, something pleasurable, because uh, certainly immediate pleasure is our best assurance of a search for eventual truths. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Well, listen, John. I, quote, you, yeah. I uh, quoted that passage from Valéry because I was thinking of meaning. Uh, we all know in speaking of an English poem that the paraphrase is not the poem. We say that again and again. And yet how many people... Uh, reading a translation of a poem, want only the meaning. It's all they care about. But that wasn't the poem to begin with. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the poet himself, of all the possible meanings, well, another good saying of Valéry is, we have more trouble finding ideas for our words than words for our <laughs> ideas. Uh, and uh, if we read the, the prose of St. John of the Cross explaining his poems, it's perfectly clear that he did not always say all that was to be said, that he never did, and that the actual meaning is a very small part of what made the poem a poem. And this is why I get rather annoyed with readers who say, I want the meaning, because that wasn't the poem, which doesn't mean that one can distort the meaning. Yeah. And the reconstitution is a reconstitution, isn't it? of meaning, kind of diction, imagery, rhythm, sound. I think if the translator comes across a sound effect, he, he may be obligated to do something about that, if the language will permit him to. Well, listen, John, would you give us one of your own translations of San Juan de la Cruz? Yeah, I translated this maybe a dozen years ago, and then I just redid it because it seemed to me that the first translation was not enough like the language of St. John of the Cross. Uh, uh, we know that his language was extremely simple and colloquial, and even rural, say critics. So how can one translate this by saying, whither hast vanished? <laughs> well, one translator did this. He obviously didn't know what kind, of, what kind of diction this was. And what I've tried to do is get back to a, a simpler kind of, uh, of English. Maybe if I read you uh, one or two stanzas of an original version, then the new version. I think there's time for that. This will show you, hmm? I think maybe you better get up. You better do this. Okay, just the new one. Yes, I have Right. All right. Uh, one of St. John of the Cross's poems about the love between God and man is written in terms of love between man and woman, as uh, all of his great poems are. He can write poems to God without ever using the word, which is one reason they're so great. They could be a human love poem. Once in the dark of night, when love burned bright with yearning, 
I arose, O oh, windfall of delight, and how I left none knows, dead to the world my house in dull repose. In the dark where all goes right, by means of a secret ladder, other close, O oh, windfall of delight. In the dark and hid from those, dead to the world my house in dull repose. There in the lucky dark, in secret, with all sleepers heavy-eyed, no sign for me to mark, no other light, no guide except for my heart, the fire, the fire inside. That led me on, keener than sunlight in the highest blue, to where there waited one I knew, how well I knew, in a place where no one was in view. O oh, dark of night, my guide, night dearer than anything all your dawns discover. O oh, night, drawing side to side the loved and lover, she that the lover loves, lost in the lover. On blossoms of my breast, kept for his pleasure garden, his alone, the lover lay lapped in rest, and I regaled my own, there in air from plumes of the cedar blown, air from the castle wall as my hand and his hair moved lovingly at play, let cool fingers fall and it seared me where they lay, all senses in oblivion drift away. I stayed, I stayed, forgot me, my forehead on the lover I reclined, slipped from the me and not me, with every care resigned among the lilies falling and out of mind. Well, uh, I think maybe we have a comment and time for a comment or two. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's uh, obviously a dangerous and delicate business of translation. Uh, the, uh, uh, the ways into translation and the uses of translation uh, are as devious and difficult as the, as the translators and their particular sense of responsibility. Uh, I think that we, we really can't say anything more or less uh, about this uh, than that, that uh, uh, the task of translation is, is a matter both of, of technical skill, of devotion to the writer, uh, of knowledge of the language, and, uh, but above all, a matter largely of conscience. Uh, of, of, how, of how far you, you can trust your own personality uh, uh, to, to intrude or to implement uh, what has been said by another man uh, in another language and most likely at another time. Do uh, you have any, any final comments, or Ben? Or? Well, the only thing I would have to say that uh, might be consoling is that we ought to accept the fact that we can never have the one true translation mm -hmm. uh, because we never had the one true original. Well, we've been here with uh, uh, American poets Ben Bellet and John Frederick Nims, also with Spanish poet, uh, modern Spanish poet Pablo Neruda and San Juan de la Cruz, far from modern. Their, them and their American voices, Ben Bellet uh, and John Frederick Nims. Stand up. Three American Poets on Creating and Translating Poetry has been presented by WETA in cooperation with the Library of Congress. The Library's literary programs are made possible by the Gertrude Clark Whittall Poetry and Literature Fund. This has been a WETA presentation. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.